Good evening. We are delighted to see you here and this wonderful crowd. It's really exciting. This is the first in our series of 12 programs that we'll have called Baytown, the Early Years, a Reminiscence. In the back of the uh, meeting room, we have a bookmark that gives our program for the whole year. I hope you'll pick one up and I hope you can join us each month. Uh, tonight, the theme is Growing Up in Baytown, and we ha have five people who will talk to us who did just that. Their names are Eileen Reinecke, Buck Young, Barney Weber, Sylvia McKinney, and Ernestine Bright. And uh, there are stars tonight, but I hope you will be too, because after they talk, they will move to the table, and we hope that you will join them in talking about your experiences. I want to take this opportunity to thank Alan Swenson and Lee College. They provided microphones, slides, and they're videotaping the program. We really do appreciate it. There are refreshments in the back, coffee, tea, and uh, cookies. So if you want something, feel free to get up and take it. Well, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. And the first one is Eileen Ronicky, who will tell us about the early years in Cedar Bayou. Van Albert Reinecke, and I was born on Cedar Bayou Crosby Road at home in 1921. I was delivered by Dr. Johnny Schilling, and he charged my father $25 for the delivery. In case some of you don't uh, realize about me, my parents and uh, grandparents came from Belgium. My great-grandfather first started coming to this country as a cotton broker and he'd buy cotton here and take it back to Belgium and sell it. When he passed away, my grandfather had to take over the business, and he, where my great-grandfather used to come to Savannah, Georgia, my grandfather started coming to Galveston. On one of his trips here, he purchased some land at Cedar Bow. And on another trip here, his mother passed away, and he said he'd never go back to Belgium. And he sent for my father, who was an only child, and for my grandmother. They both came to Galveston. My daddy came alone on a schooner. And my grandmother came later and lived in Galveston because this was pioneer time in Cedar Bow. They didn't have a decent home. I have found in my daddy, well, my grandfather loved to write. And uh, he wrote a lot about what was happening here at the time. <coughs> Uh, about the people here and uh, products and things like that. And my daddy transcribed some of these notes and I browsed through the notes and have tried to make something concise. Unfortunately, he had so much and I'm gonna try not to be long-winded. First of all, he pointed out the fact that the history of Cedar Ball is really tied into the history of Galveston because let's say in the early 1800s, who was there in Galveston Island but Jean Lafitte. And Jean Lafitte and his men rolled all around Trinity Bay, up the bayous, and uh, in 1921, Jean Lafitte completely disappeared. Nobody knows what happened to him. But many of his men stayed here. Now, the settlers at that time here, there were a lot of Karankawa Indians here, and some of Jean Lafitte's men settled here, married some of the Karankwa Indian ladies. Now also, about that time, Galveston started being known in the world as a port and uh, for commerce, and a lot of the people came to Galveston from Denmark, from Ireland, from many of the different countries in Europe. And many of these people came and settled in Cedar Bow. They were farmers, they were cattlemen, now, at that time, the only way to make a living around here was you were either a farmer or a cattleman. Now, I'm talking about previous to 1900 in the late 1980s. And at the time that my daddy came here in 1904, that was the way of making a livelihood. Now, there were no roads here. All that you had when daddy came here in 1904 were cattle trails. 
and the present roads that we know as Cedar Bay Lynchburg Road, Cedar Bay Crosby Road, those were the old cattle trails that after were developed into roads, straightened out, and they became the roads that we know today. Uh, traveling at that time when he came here was quite difficult. In 1905, he made a note that the way to get from Cedar Bow to Houston was to go over the prairie to Crosby to catch a train there. You could catch the train at 10 o'clock get to Houston one hour later, and then you could catch the same train back. It took uh, two and a half hours to get from downtown Cedar Bob to Crosby over the prairie. It took an hour to get from Crosby to Houston. And then you could catch the train back to Crosby at 4 o'clock, get to Crosby at 5, and then you might get home by dark. Now, if you wanted to go to Galveston, you could go the same route and then catch the train from Houston to Galveston, or you could catch what they had at that time, where both, well, they had a um, one mercantile store, which was the Ilfrey Mercantile Store, at Cedar Bow, on the Cedar Bow, right at the, where the ferry road and the Cedar Bow road come intersect, and I have a slide of the store, which I'm going to show. <laughs> But this was where you could catch a boat. The farmers from, from Wooster, from uh, Mont Bellevue, all these different people would bring, bring their produce there and have it sent to Galveston by these schooners, or else they would trade their produce at the Ilfrey Mercantile Store. Now, it took six hours to go from Ilfrey Grocery Store down to Cedar Bob, to the bay, and then to Galveston. And as my daddy notes, he said, and many times you would get seasick because it would get pretty rough out there. Another way that he used to go to Galveston, he would go take his rig, go from Cedar Bow, take go through two different people's property. One of them was here close to where the old jail is, close to uh, Wilkinfield, Gros uh, Wilkinfield Furniture Store and then go through the gap there, then go through another gap at the Jones property, which would be like the South Main and 146 Highway, and then go to Evergreen, where he would get one of the right boys to take him to roll him across to Morgan's Point for 25 cents a head. In 1910, the right boys got a motor for their boat, and that time the price went up to 50 cents a head. And then you could uh, take a hack, which would take you to League City, and then catch the train to go to Galveston. Another way to get to Houston would be to go overland to Lynchburg, pull your way across uh, to where, I guess, the uh, close to the St. Jacinto Monument, and then go take a hack, or well, take, you'd have your rig there and you would go and catch a streetcar in Harrisburg, and it would take you to downtown Houston. Um, he has some notes in uh, his papers about the uh, industries, the first industry in Cedar Bow. And this would be, say, in the late 1800s. It was a brick-making make place. They made bricks there to be sent to uh, Galveston and Houston. And uh, there were, at one time, 14 brickyards in Cedar Bow. And in order to get the bricks to market, they had to have boats. And so there were five boat yards there to make the boats. Also, in order to uh, drive the, the bricks in the kiln, they had a lot of men that would cut the cordwood. So the people had that trade also cutting the cordwood to put in the kilns to drive the bricks with. Um, Many, uh, there, along the Cedar Bow, there were a lot of cedar trees. That's where the name came from. And also, uh, Daddy said cypress trees. I can't feature cypress trees there, but anyway. And these were cut to make pilings in Galveston and in Houston. They cut the trees along the Cedar Bow to do that. Now, at first, before, around 1904, when Daddy came here, um, the main crops were, the, there were cattlemen, and then there was a planting of cotton and of corn. Then in 1902, 
the uh, rice, the Sanchez Rice Company came in, and so some of the people started planting rice on their property. Um, now, in 1905, there was actually only one store here, and that was the Ilfrey Mercantile Store. And then, after the rice people came in, uh, there was need for more stores, and so there was the McLean store that was built, and also W.D. Hayden had a commissary, and all of this was along the Cedar Bowl. Now, the Cedar Bowl, uh, the, uh, right down the road from the Ilfrey store was where the first, the, the first church here was built, which is the Cedar Bowl Methodist Church. And it was started in 1843. It was a small building at that time, only about 30 or 40 feet uh, square. And then next to the Methodist Church in 1970 was built the Masonic Lodge that we know today. Now the original Methodist Church no longer exists, but the second Methodist Church that we can still see today behind the new Methodist Church was the one that I remember. And that was the one that uh, uh, was still being used not too long ago, I guess about 25 years ago. Now, the Masonic Lodge was organized in 1870. It was just a one-story building. Then five years later, they built the present two-story building that we know today. Right next to it was another church. It was called the uh, Camelite Church. It was a Christian church, and it no longer exists, but it stood where the Cedar, Ball, the Cedar Crest Cemetery uh, is. And uh, the Masonic Lodge is the oldest Masonic Lodge in the state of Texas, and it's the one that we still see today on the, fair, on the old ferry road. And in 1888, the Masonic Lodge purchased the land behind it for the Masonic Cemetery, and that's where my parents and grandparents are buried. Now, in 1908 was when they discovered the, when they had the first well here. And, of course, at, after that, Cedar Bay really changed. It became Boomtown. And uh, where the land was selling for $9 an acre, in 1905, in 1908, it shot up to $200 an acre. So there was quite a drastic change, and it was no longer the old Cedar Bay that my daddy knew. Now, I have a few slides, and uh, where is the instrument? Oh, okay. All right. These slides were made from postcards. At that time, apparently, they would make postcards. And this is what the city model looked like in 1907, and it really hasn't changed that much. All right, this is the RC. These are cattle crossing the Cedar Bile on the uh, left hand side of the picture. You can't tell too much, but they're on the right side who are uh, pushing the cattle into the water. And this is the RC Everson cattle. This is a picture that I thought was unique. My dad and mommy visited in 1907. Can everybody hear me? And uh, you see the children then had uh, bicycles like today. A lady is on horseback. And in the back, I don't know if you can notice, there is a surrey with a fringe on the top. Uh, this is the old Tompkins Road of Tompkins House in the background. And this, I presume, is actually the, what is now today 146 Highway. And Daddy noted, this picture was 1907, but Daddy noted on the back, gone 20 years, but that this house was still in existence, and I presume that this is the house on the corner, or near, Matthew Tompkins, the intersection of Matthew Tompkins and 146 Highway. Uh, this is the old, uh, this is the very old, this didn't print too well. There's a building right here, which is the Hill Free Warehouse, and the Cedar Bay Stream would be running here on the other side of these bushes. And this would be the Ilfrey store, and on the other side, the McLean store. Okay, this is the McLean store, which was on the south side of what uh, we know now. And this is the Cedar Bay Street, passing people in the boat. And the Cedar Bay Road is right here, and Ferry Road goes this way. All right, this is another uh, 
picture of uh, the McLean store and one of these scooters that would take the produce to Cedar County out. This again, the McLean store. <laughs> which now turns into Ferry Road, actually had a full ferry right here. When I was little, we used to go to Chambers County on the full ferry. And this is the McLean store. This is the ferry right here, and you just pull your way across. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of uh, the Deputy Hayes in Brickyard. <laughs> but this is a picture of one of the um, uh, ship building places. And this is, uh, again, this is a ship building, mm -hmm. and Daddy noted on the back that this man that was holding this ship was Captain George, and that's Carl Overshek's father-in-law. Uh, all right, this was the original parsonage uh, for the Methodist Church. This is Ferry Road going north, and this was the original Methodist Church. This is another picture of the parsonage and the Methodist Church. All this is on the side of the present city of our Methodist Church. This was the Masonic block, the one that's staying in the grave. That was the Carmelite Church, and this is where we now have Cedar Crest Cemetery. This is another picture of the Masonic block, just almost as it stands today. The uh, 1920 picture of the Cedar Bob Methodist Church that's now behind the new Methodist Church. And I read recently in the paper that they're going to reconstruct it. And this is a 198 picture of the way they used to, this is one of the, some of the original wells at Cedar Isle, I mean at Goose Creek, and this is an earthen uh, lake. This is oil. That's the way they used to store it. And that's where I want to stop because this is the end of the Cedar Law as my daddy knew it as a young man. It's when they started heading the boom town here. Thank you. That was delightful. Next, we have Buck Young, who grew up in Pelly and Old Baytown. And he's had articles published in historical journals and he remembers using the library in Pelly City Hall for his reading pleasure. Buck. Oh. Didn't know if I'd be tall enough for this thing. Everybody see me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm what Eddie Cleveland calls a Pelly rat. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know who Eddie Cleveland was, he was the last mayor of the city of Pelly and the first mayor of the city of Baytown. And he and his wife ran the Leggett Drug Store in Old Pelly. I was born in Pelly in August of 1932, and except for a brief move out of town and back into town, uh, spent my formative years in Pelly up until 1946, at which point then we moved over to Old Baytown on Maryland Street and there I completed my, quote, growing up in Baytown phase. Uh, I'm not going to go into any of the old historical things about the early days of, of Pelly and the uh, boom days and everything because other people might uh, want to cover that. I want to tell you what I remember uh, as a boy in the city of Pelly. Kind of take you on a little stroll down Main Street, so to speak. Okay. First of all, we would go down and we would see the big Welcome to Pelly sign that stood right in front of the city hall. Two-story red brick city hall. And this was a part of our city government where they had their meetings. And downstairs, the Harris County Library had their branch. And I spent, as I said, many an hour in that library. I have no idea how many books I read but somewhere in here, I still have my library card. And for one year period, I checked out 66, count them, 66 books. And I'm sure I read every one of them. Okay. Kind of catter-cornered across the street as, again, we got to the drugstore. Leggett's Drugstore. It was a corner drugstore then, and it moved one uh, house over one uh, 
place over to the old Edomite Cafe. <clears throat> but there in that drugstore, uh, I must have consumed uh, my weight in strawberry ice cream sodas, root beer floats, cherry phosphates, you know, hand-packed vanilla ice cream put in those little square boxes, you know, with the iron, I mean, with a with wire handle. And matter of fact, my brother and I, one time, we, we were rich with 50 cents, so we bought a quart of that ice cream and then a dozen donuts next door, and we went behind the city hall there on the fire, where they had the fire hoses, the racks, and we got ourselves just gloriously sick. <laughs> we had uh, a few characters that hung around the drugstore. Uh, one in particular I remember, we called him Killer Bear Jeff. Uh, this was a large, kind of a simple-minded fellow. He caused no harm, but he always wore these slouchy, oversized overalls. And he had a toy pistol that he carried with him all the time. And when you saw Jeff, you always said, kill any bears today, Jeff? And he'd say, always, kill two. <laughs> but we had uh, also, we had at our barber shop, the Creel's barber shop where we went to, we had uh, a man that I remember quite well. He was a black man called Tamp. He shined the shoes, and this was long before I heard this old Chattanooga shoe shine boy, but he could make that rag pop. Tamp uh, had lost both his legs at the knee when he was a young man, a train ran over him. And he got around town, he, and he got everywhere he wanted to on a little scooter. A little scooter next to the ground, and he had these hinges, leather hinges on his knees, and he had to scoot all over the place. But he made his living shining shoes. And everyone knew Tamp, and Tamp knew everyone too. Okay. Uh, right up the street, then we had the Alamo, the Alamo Picture Show. And I saw probably 2,000 grade B westerns <laughs> with Lash LaRue, Johnny Mac Brown, Tim Hope, Tim McCoy, Charles Sterrett. Remember those? War epics, Tarzan movies. And each Friday night or Saturday we'd go and we'd see the latest chapter in the continued piece. Huh? They call them serials, we always call them continued pieces. Walking around, I might go down by the Sunbright Bar and talk to a couple old friends there. One's name was Goat, uh, was, you know, Goat Elliot and Gopher Jackson. And that's what we called them. Or we'd go past uh, a, the, the domino parlor called the Oasis Club, and the door always stood open. I always had the door propped open, and there would be the old men playing dominoes. And they'd be shuffling those, dynamo, those dominoes around and playing 42 and Moon. Do it all day, all night long. Or I'd run into the hot tamale man. This man's name was Juarez. And he built the first red brick home in Old Bait Town with his hot tamale money. And he pushed this cart all over town. He went down to the ferry, down to Morgan's Point, down the ferry, but he'd have these hot tamales. And he had the pot inside over a small fire. And when he'd lift that lid open, that steam would bellow out, and that smell of chili peppers would go all over the place. I think, I'm not quite sure, I think he sold them for a quarter for a baker's dozen. And he always wrapped them in a page of the Houston Press. I don't know if you remember the Houston Press, that was a scandal sheet. But I swear they added flavor to those tamales. We had Inez. Inez was our rag picker. She also pushed a hand cart, and she collected things that everyone didn't want. Now, this was before the garage sale, folks. So nobody saved these things or sold them to somebody. They had usually just put them out on the corner, and they knew Inez would come along and pick them up. And that's how she made her living. Now, our movie and our ice cream money usually came from selling junk to Lee Allen. Now, Lee Allen was our junk man, and he bought copper and iron and brass and bottles and everything, and he, I know, he cheated us. We knew, we knew he cheated us. 
So occasionally we'd go and steal the stuff back from at night and sell it back to us. <laughs> okay. Then I moved to Baytown, to Maryland Street. And we call Maryland Street the wettest street in town. And we did that because at one end was Black Duck Bay and at the other end was two beer joints. <laughs> Malt Churches and the Longhorn. Yeah, that was her name, Maul Churches. She was a good lady. I used to stop there practically every day. I delivered the Houston Press, and I'd stop there for my rest stop, and she'd buy a paper from me for a nickel. Then I'd give her a nickel back to buy an RC, and then another nickel to buy a package of planters peanuts. And then we'd take a swig and put those peanuts in that RC, and it would eat and drink simultaneously. Also, we had Brown's Chicken Shack out on it. Now, of course, I was going into, I was a teenager now, you know, and we'd go out and uh, we'd go to Brown's Chicken Shack to get chicken salad sandwiches and to hassle the car hops and to, as I say, as much to be seen, to see and be seen as to eat. Uh, I had a good friend there who ran a bicycle shop not far from Maryland Street. He was an old German, and his name was Klaus Hamstraub. And he earned his living repairing bicycles and tricycles, but he was, a, he was a, quite a philosopher. He and I used to talk all the time, and he had a sign out in front, and he used to uh, hand paint these, these sands on them all the time. And he'd, he'd kind of alternate. He'd have Kipling, you know, one week or some other philosopher on, and then he'd make up something. You know, and I, I remember one, it says, uh, laugh and the world laughs, will you? You know, snore and you sleep alone. <laughs> uh, of course, there, uh, Baytown was uptown compared to Pelly. We had, we had two movie theaters there. You know, we had the Arcadia. And, you know, one of the last time I was looking for, you know, the Arcadia is gone now. But you know that right in front, the word is still printed on there. But we had the Arcadia, and then we had the Bay Theater, which was the newest theater in the Tri-Cities at that time. It played all the first-run movies. But uh, I hope I've given you a, a little bit of tour, as I say, of, of the old hometown. Uh, I sincerely believe it was a simpler time then. Uh, I know it was kind of slow-paced. It was before we lost our innocence. Uh, especially before the A-bomb. But uh, as a kid, I walked the streets without fear. We never locked our doors. We knew every neighbor, not only on our street, but about six streets around. Everyone by name, they knew us. They helped out. If we were in trouble, we helped them when we were in trouble. But maybe it wasn't the, quote, good old days. But to me, they were. Thank you very much. Let me give you, like they do on television, you know, if you want more, here's a pitch for the library. Uh, this is called the East Texas Historical Journal. I'm a member of the association. I have had two articles published in this journal. This one here is volume 20, 1982. Volume, uh, where I write in quite detail about my early days in Pelly and Baytown. I call it a remembered utopia. And then this one here, uh, volume 22, 1984, volume 2, is, uh, has an article where I talk about my days in Anson Jones Elementary. Anson Jones, dear Anson Jones. So if you want to, they're in the library here too. Thank you. Next, we have Barney Webber, and he's retired from teaching, but he remembers growing up in East James before moving to the State Streets. First of all, don't tell Dr. Capilio I'm out of the house. I was confined for a month after a Christmas operation. I'm not supposed to be here, but I'd already promised order, so I'm here. I went back about February 1920. My dad had got a job from Nice poured out the refinery area to a little mud hole over here called the New Home Refinery. And only mules were being used. The 
ordered the first eight tractors to be used in the refinery so he couldn't stand over me stepping on his lunch and everything else. Um, so mom got on the, on the train um, in Port Arthur and uh, was going to move with my older brother, sister and me over to Baytown in about March of 1920. We were approaching Dayton and we pulled up to the Dayton station. There were several people on the platform and mom um, asked somebody on the train, said, is there some dignitary that's on the train? And he said, no ma'am. So that's a bunch of Goose Creek people. They haven't seen a train. <laughs> She was headed for Goose Creek. We went to Houston and Dad had a chicken to bring us, of course, to Baytown at that time. We moved into Kent City, which is um, well, just Grassland now. Later, the Stucco Houses were built there. That was my paper route, but it's gone too. But somewhere west of the Saddest um, um, Gate and on around the Crow Gate was a large Kent City. They put a uh, single man in one area, a uh, family families in other areas, and they had a community uh, bath house, well, correct there, <laughs> bath house divisions for different people, and a community mess hall for food to be served. Well, that wasn't, of course, a most delightful place to live, but there was a shortage of carpenters who were all being read by the refinery, and so that's the best good at the time. So the, our next move before our brothers be born in August, 1920, my dad thought it would be out of the fence, so we moved to what we call the Humble Cottages, over here on Sterling Street and D.P. and right all the way to Republic. By the way, it was Street Sterling, D.P., Texas, Pierce, uh, Gulf, Humble, American, and Republic were the eight oil companies. That's what started naming the streets for. And uh, so we lived in a place about where the uh, old post office, that I call it Old Mound, uh, parking space was behind there. We didn't even hide there on the third. Right behind us, where the post office was later built, was Dr. Lillard's home. And he delivered all the babies in the Baytown area. Uh, he gave it um, a house called straight from his home if he wanted to come to um, his house. He had an area set aside to take care of patients. Uh, in Tim City, my brother Charlie, older than I am, was about seven years old, but he said he'd wander in and out of the refinery, and the boilermakers would say, come sit on my lap and help me drive this rivet. Or the other would say, no, come over here and help me with this bucket plate, you know. And can you imagine a seven-year-old wandering into and out of the, out of the refinery? Then um, we moved over to East James Street about 1922. Uh, that's the first block of East James, just east of um, uh, four houses from North Main, called North Youth Creek Street at that time. I remember the wood sidewalk that uh, ran uh, for about two blocks there. I remember Jack's Cafe and Seaver Baker. This is the first time Seaver came to Baytown. And Solaire and Grand Meter, Grenader's Grocery, Bradbury's Poultry House, and the little one-story, one one-room jail, I'll tell you about that later, and wooden sidewalk. And, uh, but one of the early remem remembrances that I had, and a frightening one, I, I was sitting one time at our house and the duplex across the street and uh, the doctor came out of the house, put a little blue card up there on the other side of the duplex, the blue card there, went down two doors, put a blue card there. Well, I've seen these pink and orange and blue and green cards around and I knew they had something to do with the doctor and my sickness. I said, Mom, what's the blue card over there for? I said, well, they have flu in their house. I said, well, is that bad? Oh, yes, if people die of the flu sometimes. I began to cry and she said, what's the matter? I said, well, we have a flu in our house. <laughs> 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 she explained it was influenza, not the flu that ran into <laughs> And um, the little one in jail, I believe it was on East Sterling or East Beefy, somewhere right in that area. Keep it for sure. And uh,